If you don't know me, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Bill Meyer. I'm the morning host on KMED and KCMD in Grants Pass. And we were kind of looking at this uh, House Bill 2020 for a long, long time and been really concerned about this. And I see this as a real attack on Southern Oregon's way of life. I also see no net benefit of House Bill 2020 for the people. And I know that there are many that are supporting House Bill 2020, the carbon cap and trade, they call it the Clean Energy Jobs Bill. And that's all fine. They can believe in fairy tales all you want, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, what we're talking about is uh, the creation of fake markets. These carbon markets that they're talking about doing have no bearing in real life. There would never be a market for carbon dioxide, which each and every one of us is breathing out as we, as we breathe in oxygen. Each and every one of us is doing this. I never thought we would get to a point that a gas that dope growers are pumping into greenhouse gas, into greenhouses, would then be, on the other hand, if it's coming out of my exhaust pipe, it's killing the planet. If it's going into the greenhouse, it's a wonderful thing to help, to help plants and trees grow better. So we're going to have a good conversation here for the next, uh, I don't know, hour, hour and a half, however long it takes to go through things. And our show's crack researcher, Ed, we know him as Mr. X, ladies and gentlemen. He's not an attorney, but he has the heart and mind of one. It's true. Ed, you could have been an attorney, really. Because he, he comes on the show and he brings in voluminous stacks of legal documents. And he's, going, and he's going through policies, and he's going through laws, and he goes through mining, and he, I mean, you just do all of that, Ed. And we thank you so much for uh, your service, and because it really is, yeah, he may have the mind of a lawyer, but it's the heart of a servant. And it's uh, due to a lot of his, influ his input and influence that we're having this talk tonight. I want to thank a bunch of people before we get things rolling first. And I guess we inadvertently shamed Kevin G. He was going to be at the Smart Meter meeting in Josephine County tonight. And that's okay. That, there's still a lot to work on that Smart Meter meeting. Thank you very much. Time was of the essence, and Kevin G. decided to come here and take this up tonight. And I imagine you'll get it on your YouTube channel then. All right. Kevster. What's it now? Kevster. K-E-V-S-T-I-R. Kevster. K-E-V-S-T-I-R. All right. Something else I was going to mention to you is that we've done a lot of copying, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of people made copies of good information in order to formulate effective public comments Saturday when the, the Oregon State Carbon Reduction Committee, Carbon Reduction Committee on a carbon-based planet, carbon life form based planet, we're going to have a carbon reduction committee. What do you think that means for us? We're carbon-based life forms, are we? You reduce carbon? You know, make life more expensive, all the rest of it. Now, you want to make effective comments. That's what we want to do. It's, it's, you, don't, you don't want to be just one of those people that stands up and says, House Bill 2020, you commies, no! <laughs> You'd feel really good about it. Yeah. I mean, you might feel really good. But, <laughs> but we want to be smart, frankly, the way many of our great opponents have. They've been doing this for a long time. They've been working the system. They've been working the policy consensus. They've been working the state university system. Is that a, kind of a good way to put that, Ed, the way they worked it? What you, what you just said is exactly the truth. And we have to let them feel good. We have to be smart. We have to take and make a stand based on the correct, correct comment. The and by the way, put the microphone right in your mouth. Right in my mouth, okay. Right Sorry about that. And, when I look at it, it's imperative to understand the nature of the comment is everything. I shared with Bill a few minutes ago, there was a, a sheet here that he brought in from the gas people, and it was just very interesting because in their conclusion, this is a comment in itself, and it's in the first few words. HB 2020, as currently composed, is punitive to Oregon's natural gas customers and unfair. Now think about those words. I, you know, They continue with a whole paragraph, but when they say it's punitive, what does that mean? That is, the, the state exists not to cause punitive harms to us. That's the reality. 
How do they deserve the right to push a bill like this through? Based upon a feel-good protocol. That's the part of it that we have to gravitate to. That's what we have to understand. But we have to understand the nature of making a comment to push those legislative factors that are involved. We have to convince them and show them that we outnumber that type of attitude, that we have a presence, okay? A lot of these people exist in group to group in a cross-reference type thing, and they have all kinds of things. As soon as Bill and I announced that this meeting was taking place, a day later, two days later, magically, uh, Alan Jordan, Jor what is it? Jor Alan Jordan. Jordan, yeah. and so can is but having nice a guy, wrong though. Wrong, you know, it's yeah. just, yeah. he's welcome to his opinion. He is not welcome to force his opinion down my throat. And that is what punitive means. They're forcing their opinion down our throats. So the question is, how do we combat it? We combat it by becoming educated in a way to do it and by what we're doing here. I look at it, I told Bill the other day, I look at it, if we can get a, you know, a full house here, I look at what I call a sphere of influence, okay? Each one of you knows folks. Each one of you can help get people there. I was gonna bring a roll of fabric and cut armbands out if we ran out of vests, okay? But the reality is, if we wear yellow, that signifies solidarity. You look at that term years and years ago when I was a younger man. I think it left Valenza in Poland, created a movement based on solidarity that tore down incredible things and, and created a substance that we can go back to. But it's just history. But we have, to we have to take that same thing and have a solidarity. We have to look at life and say, you know, we're moving ahead one way or another. If we move ahead and we don't battle these people right now and tell them that this is our country and our state also, that they don't get to use a false consensus-based policy down, you know, and ram it down our throats, we have to stand there and say, no, this is wrong. And so part of that process where we slipped up as, as a group, as I got older, I said, I want to find out how and why. Why is this happening? I got mad. And I started researching this stuff. And I found their pathways. And it was all based on the logic of if I knew where they were going, I could head them off at the pass. I could beat them at their own game. If I understood their end game, we could try to beat them and then learn. But the thing was, their end game was so far ahead, so advanced, and so structured within the system. And that's, that's the learning curve part of it. Now, I've been talking with Bill for a long time now, and he, fortunately, that we've been able to do this and been able to educate people, and we've made a difference. We have created a huge difference. The folks out there in the trenches, the smart meter people, everyone is working against smart meters. This was one of the biggest intrusions on your life that you can imagine. And it's all tied into this bill. It's all there to be punitive to you. And the people that stand up and fight it need your help. They need input. They need everybody to, to start arguing on their behalf. And that's part of the whole thing as we move ahead and we go forward. We have to understand that this battle, it, they broke it up into so many different attacks. We're getting attacked on every level, every forefront. You read this bill, I printed it off today, and it was a monumental task to, to do that without just going crazy. Because as I read it, as I read each page and I look at it, you know the end result is who it's not punitive to? The PER, the PER system, <laughs> okay? Now, I have nothing against the retirement thing and the PERS thing. This is a commitment. But they don't get to make a magical fix with this type of thing being punitive to your life on every level, your sons, your daughters, people's relatives, everybody that you can imagine across the board will be affected by this. And we have to look at it like that and say, each step of the way, this is just one step. And we can't have the luxury of being mad. I can get mad. I got mad years ago. I got mad when Rahm Emanuel sat on a, on a thing when Obama first took office. And he said, I wouldn't want to be a white guy in this country for the next 10 years. Now that, I, and I looked at it, or a white guy over 50. I looked at it and I said, well, what is he waging war on me for? That was the first moment of my life where I, got, I looked at it and said, this is an indicator 
And this is where I have to start getting active. Why are people waging war against anybody of any skin color, of anything in that regard? This is America. We have the land, the opportunity, and we have the ability. And I look at these things and I read them and I just get mad. And I'm sorry, I don't want to go on too far with that, but as I look at this, I, I no, gotta, you're doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to get a message across that as we go through this. I'm, this is what I want to spend the most time on, and I don't want to go too far. So the when I get to it, it's the Oregon State Legislature. This is who we are trying to convince. This is who we have to do. And in all honesty, it is not just this meeting, okay? It's consistently from this point forward with every bit of the sphere of influence that I talked about. Kevin G videotapes for years now. Kevin, he has a gigantic sphere of influence when you look at it. That was the whole theory. He could present the truth of what was going on to people who couldn't make it. This whole system evolved around a system where they kept us out of the part of it that they were moving ahead. We had no knowledge of what they would do. Where would you expect that the place that you live, the state that you reside, that they would come to you and say, oh, we're going we're gonna to make it almost impossible for you to live here because you, uh, you, you have a carbon uh, problem and uh, we don't like this anymore. We're going to get rid of you. We're going to get rid of your business. We're going to tax your business. We're going to tax you into non-existence. We're going to move everything in here and we're just going to have the greatest green economy. Well, part of their green economy, an article I read the other day, and I mentioned this on Bill's show, but the reality was it was sickening to me because they were talking about retraining gas station attendants. Now, there's nothing wrong with a gas station attendant. I'm not saying anything against anybody's job. What I'm saying is that this is their mentality. You know, you look at it and say, this is how they think that we're going to progress. This is how they think that life is going to go ahead. This is the consensus process at work. This is a predetermined outcome. And this is what I've talked about so much on Bill's show. Because this exists within the state. They have used this protocol on every level to attack everything. Every problem we face. The fires, okay? One of the things in this bill, they talk about, have the nerve to talk about, environmental justice, okay? Now, there's a, a brochure I have here. When I... When now, I you, you, now this, hold on, you may yeah. laugh, but that's in, that is, this is taken seriously in those quarters. Oh! You have to understand. And the, the we, way we, laugh at, we laugh at it and just regard it at our own peril. We clap for it at the meeting with our wonderful senator. And that's what I was getting at. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question. As you're sitting here and you think about the past couple of summers, what we've experienced, Okay, what happened in our state, in our area, in our region the past couple of years? We had a, we had unlivable summers. Our economy was devastated. Every aspect of it is. Well, what does that make us? And I, instead of getting mad, I sat back and I said, Well, what does that make us? That makes us a disadvantaged community. <laughs> okay. Now their whole thing is about disadvantaged communities. That's why they need the carbon tax. Well, we're a disadvantaged community, but we're disadvantaged because they brought it to us. When you break down the fire policies, when you break this all down, it was a predetermined outcome to restore our forests. And I look at this and I say, now they're burning the forests, creating carbon release, and yet they want to tax us for our own carbon release, but yet they want to keep going on with an environmental justice but there is no justice. And we don't want to uh, go too much off the rails on that before we get into the commenting, but you have to understand that every acre of federal land that we, that we endure the smoke from in the summertime has a burn plan on it. And it's not part, and that's when we talk about the let it burn policy from 1995, which has been updated several times over the years, but it is still there. What we term let it burn is that uh, you'll have natural fire, igni natural fire ignition. In other words, you have a lightning strike, let's say that's considered a natural fire, and if there is a burn plan on that land to, to allow it to burn for land management purposes, then it will be permitted to do it. Uh, Merv George has an example with the Klondike fire uh, last summer. We had a you know, lightning strike out there, a couple of lightning strikes, and they practically go out there and draw 
you know, 100,000 acre box around, uh, around everything and just let it burn throughout that because it ended up satisfying land management policy. Land management policy, the fire, the let it burn, the fire management policy is replacing what timber used to do. That's right. They don't have people going out there and cutting trees down and thinning forests, and so we allow fire to do the work. Problem is we're having to breathe in the results of that work in the summer, and our lives and economy are destroyed. So that's the price that we're paying. But that is, again, an example of a consensus-based process. So they bring you the harm without your consent. Our silence is our consent. That's the two things that you have to walk away from here with. If we don't comment, if we don't have a written comment, if we don't have a, a verbal comment, if we don't do these things, it's our consent, and that's just how it works. In every aspect, that's how the, how the whole process works. And it's defined in law. It's defined in administrative rule. They have things in, in the smart meter uh, dive with people. This is what I tried to explain to them. The Public Utility Commission has a 400-page document that's a division of the Oregon Administrative Rules and the Oregon Revised Statutes. 400 pages that says exactly what the Public Utility Commission can do and must do according to law. So what we did is we dissected that. <laughs> and you brought forward what the law was. Now they're kind of getting into a point where they, they had to Im implement it because it was 10 years with our consent. We didn't activate ourselves early enough because we didn't know this was coming. Nobody really started fighting the smart meter was being put on their home. That's right. And that's just, I say this as an example, okay? It's an example of what they've done here. They tried to pass this a year ago, 2018. There's another copy. You can research it on the internet. They refined it a little, and now they have what they think is the uh, legislative power to go ahead and do it. I hope our, our representatives understand to use every bit of the tools in the toolbox that they can if they have to deny them quorum, but it's up to us. They may not have to use that if we do our jobs, okay? And that's... And by the way, by the way, uh, Kim Wallen, Representative Kim Wallen said this morning that not all Democrats, there is not, they are not united on this carbon cap and trade, all right? The fact of the matter is that if enough people come out and we are able to show with our logic and good sense that this is not the way to move forward, exactly right. you give these people, uh, these uh, what I, who I would term more sensible democratic legislators, political cover to be able to do what's right for the people. Exactly right. And when I look at that, you, the things that irritate me, the things I try to touch on, like right now, this is the thing that motivated me. So I turned my anger into motivation. I said, instead of being mad, let me get even. Let me get, let me get a move to it where if I understand it and I can move it ahead. And then, by the grace of God, you know, Bill and I brought this forward. And we're able to bring to you accurate information. All of the things that I bring forward are the exact documents that these people hand over to one another, that these people send to one another, that are literally the written law the, and every aspect of it. And what it takes is the time to read them. It takes the time to interpret them. But when you look at the aspect of this bill, when I go back to environmental justice, in their introduction, this was done, uh, let's see, President Clinton established the federal government's position on environmental justice in February 1994 through Executive Order 12898. In the intervening decades, communities of color and low-income communities disproportionately impacted by environmental burdens and health risks, nonprofit advocacy organizations, and academic institutions and government municipalities have struggled to achieve environmental justice by ensuring fair treatment and opportunities for meaningful involvement for all people and communities. Well, that's all a crime. No, no, wait a minute, though. Even if you were to take him at his word, that describes Jackson and Josephine County. That's exactly Especially right. rural Jackson and Josephine that's County. That's exactly right. That's what I'm saying. And also what we have to do is understand a, a term called reflexive. There's a term in the environmental law thing. It's called reflexive law. This is where a lot of the administrative rules are developed. They're developed around reflexive law. So they take what we grew up with. They took, 
They take what generations have saw as the actual law and they look at it and they get it into a judge in an administrative courtroom and it's looked at and labeled as a reflexive law. Oh, I'll, find, I'll make my finding out of that, you know, things have changed, times have changed and we can't do it. I go back to what is the legislative intent when that law was passed. I look at the legislative intent on this and I can make an assumption by their own words. Their assumption is to be what the Northwest Natural Gas Association here said it's punitive. Why do they want to be punitive to us as a region? All of it, your every bit of it is about that term when you look at it. There's a lot of other terms that we'll get into, but when you make these connections, that's the motivation, that's the background, that's the idea that we have to you know, communicate. And, and, and if you were going to take notes tonight, please write down the word punitive. I would hope that you would use punitive in your written comment or your oral comments if you get a chance to testify. I don't know how many of us will get a chance to speak on Saturday. I'm going to sign up and I hope a lot of other, other people are going to sign up too. Who knows? who's going to get to speak and who will not. Punitive is one adjective or one term that should be, I think, uh, festooned throughout your comments. Punitive, you are hurting us. You are destroying our way of life. And the reason that I'm focusing right at the moment on environmental justice is because it plays such a key role here. But if I look at this a little further, uh, from where I left off. It says, despite this federal, state, and local attention, community color, communities of color in low-income communities continue to bear disproportionate risk of adverse health impacts as a result of government decision-making. Okay? Now that's the critical line, government decision-making. There we go, there's Jackson and Josephine County, again. That's, again, that's the thing. That's what's harmed us, is that government decision-making. But now we have to use that term environmental justice possibly against them. We have to sit back and say, we have to label ourselves. We are a disadvantaged community. That can be a comment. We, we are looking at you saying, your aspect of environmental justice has to include us as disadvantaged because we have suffered and our economy has suffered. We can go into these things and use that part of it to help a direction that we can move into this to gain power against them, okay? To give you an idea, the task force definition, environmental justice is equal protection from environmental and health hazards and meaningful public participation in decisions that affect the environment in which people live, work, learn, practice spirituality, and play. Okay? Now let's... What do you think? What do you, what do you feel? Do you feel good when you hear that? Or does it irritate you? Well, it irritates the heck out of me, I'll tell you, right? You know, be very honest. I mean, I look at that and it... Yeah, what, but, but there are times, though, that, all right, use the term against them. That's right. And that's what I'm saying. I look at it and say, well, if we have to bear with your nightmarish moves, then let's give you what we've learned from it. Let's go after that aspect. And it's that term in there that I said, public participation. That's what we're here for, that public participation. You know why we're here for that? The whole thing goes back to the consensus thing that I talked about a little bit ago, because they try to exclude it in the history of the legislation as it's developed. They have to actually have to justify and show in every level of these things, in every move they make, that there is a history of public acceptance and desire to have it go through. They have to try to show that. Well, for years, they accomplished that through the consensus movement. They, brought, they would bring in a predetermined outcome, and they still do it. Everything in Oregon right now. I'll give you an example. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, Dominic De La Sella, everyone's favorite uh, philosophy major, uh, who is uh, invited to uh, testify before our Congress all the time, about our environmental policy here in Southern Oregon. Right. He's always invited. He's invited to the uh, to the podium. Uh, we have an example in the uh, in the uh, smart meter uh, misery, which is being visited upon uh, both Jackson and Josephine County. That's right. Nature Conservancy is considered speaking for us. Right. Now think about the that. Sierra Club. 
also. Yeah, or Sierra Club, pardon me, yeah. I, I think I was Sierra Club, not major right. conservancy. Well, in the smart oh, TNC was probably in there, too. They're all yeah. probably in there, but. Well, like in the smart meter program, to give you all an idea, there were, if I remember correctly on the page, there were 17 total, and two were in Oregon. The rest were in Idaho, Utah, and Montana. Those were the stakeholders that decided how the smart meters would be implemented. The whole implementation program was based upon people saying that they wanted to, the Sierra Club, I remember one specifically, they wanted to have a, uh, what did they call it, a, a private public meeting or something. It, it was, uh, you know, it was like a violation of the law, what they asked for. They, you know, it's public participation. So they were hiding everything. So we're here to bust the racket wide open on that's Saturday, okay? That, that's, I mean, that, that's really part of it. I think Ed, we're gonna have to move along and actually start talking that's, about what is actually... Well, that's what I wanna try to... Okay, what we need to do when it comes to uh, digging into, con, into comments. I'll give you an example here. By the way, uh, I didn't get a chance to mention this in the beginning. I wasn't able to, uh, to copy off everything I would have wanted to and been able to give everybody a copy of everything. I didn't know how many people were gonna show up, just didn't have time. But I had put together a 15-page PDF including uh, who to send uh, written comments to via email. Uh, e. Warner Reschke, state representative, uh, sent me the email addresses today. If you will just email me at the radio station, just bill at billmyershow.com, I'll send you back the PDF and you can print it out for yourself. It's kind of some, some great cheat sheets. A lot of the stuff we're also seeing here within that PDF uh, you may have picked up out front when you were coming in, but just email it to me and I'll get it back to you in a pretty timely fashion. But I was gonna tell you though how we can learn from our uh, friends, the gang greens. And, well, you know, I, I think, hey, when you're, when you're doing something right and you've been so successful, they're not doing something right, they're just, they're working the process very well. And that's something that I think that uh, people of better sense have not been doing so well. Uh, we've almost thought that, well, we vote for a good representative and we go back and watch TV at night and think we've done our job. That's it. And meanwhile, uh, the Green Agenda, they organize, they raise money, they elect politicians, and they hold their politicians' feet to the fire to do what they want, all right? But here is um, an example that Our Family Farms, did anybody get that Our Family Farms yeah. email? Yeah, I'm on that, I'm, I was on that list. And I was supportive of what they were trying to do a few years ago with the GMO, but you know, they, they made some points, and, but uh, they're supporting House Bill 2020, which means I think they're wrong, wrong, wrong on this. Okay. I deleted them. Uh, no, no. I think it's. I think it's always good to hear uh, from people who you disagree with. And that way, you know, you know, keep your friends close, your enemies, potential enemies closer, you know, that sort of thing. But uh, they actually had a pretty good example of a comment. Now I'm going to read their comment. They have a suggestion for a comment. Now they're supporting House Bill 2020. You could take a page from the same type of comment and tweak it and use much of the verbiage for your own more sensible and liberty-protecting, life-protecting uh, purpose. Okay, so I'm just gonna read that, is that okay, Ed? Yeah, no, that's, All right. that's a great example. Yeah, this is a great example. It's uh, less than a page long. It says, co-chairs Denbro and Power and members of the committee, so they're very polite, and you wanna be polite about it, All right? Because if you're just gonna tell them to go to hell, they're just gonna, eh, fine, that's nice. You might feel good, but then you're ignored. My name is so-and-so, I am owner of such and such. If you're able to comment on behalf of an organization, include that here. For example, I'm the owner of such a farm, or I'm writing on behalf of myself and the and the uh, the green the green unicorn fart energy association, <laughs> whatever that might be. Okay, I think that's Senator Jeff Merkley's uh, favorite pet organization. <laughs> but anyway, I love the Merk. Anyway. It says, I strongly support HB 2020, also known as the Clean Energy Jobs, which will put a cap in price on greenhouse gas emissions in Oregon and invest in solutions. I have seen the impacts of climate change on my farm, and then, you, and then they put in there, describe what you've noticed, such as fires, drought, extreme heat, and how it has impacted you as a producer. And then it goes into how they say the Clean Energy Jobs Bill is a win for the environment and the economy. There's absolutely no proof of that. In fact, any of the logical evidence, which we've also provided in a lot of these other hands out, handouts, you can turn that comment on its head by saying, hey, here's why it's not gonna work. Here's why it's corrupt. You know, here it is, it's putting 750 million or whatever it is into the hands of unaccountable and unaccountable climate czar who will then hand it out 
to the future Elon Musks from California and Oregon that are going to milk the taxpayer system. You know, that's it. You can start going down, down that path. And then um, they conclude with uh, over 200 farms and other agricultural stakeholders. God, I love that. I love that term, stakeholders. What does that mean? Stakeholders, uh, well, it, 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 stakeholders, and for that, that's the sign of the bureaucratic policy consensus monster in which they pretend, well, as an example, Climate dams. You have stakeholders. Stakeholders are not actual property owners or farmers or people that actually live in the area. It's a bunch of people who get together in the same room because they were invited with one purpose in mind, and that was, well, in that example, pull the dams out. Hey, do you think that that dam should come out? Yes, I do think the dam should come out. Well, that's great because the governor over here thinks the dam should come out. Let's pull the dam out. And then you ask, well, what about the climate compact? Well, they weren't invited as stakeholders, you know, the signatories to that. I mean, it's kind of a shorthand way of how they do the scam. They fake you out. Well, we've all consented to it in that room. Well, in reverse, we are the stakeholders. Yeah, we're the true stakeholders. We live here. We recreate that's, here. That's the reality. We are the true, true keepers of this system that we call that we have. Sorry. Uh, the... You know, like Bill, when you when you went through that, there's a couple of things, you know, that you go to, and they divide people up. And the other term that you got to take along with stakeholders is a facilitated meeting with stakeholders. You know what the facilitator's main goal is? Is it's to guide everyone in that room to the predetermined outcome. And that usually includes, how many meetings have you gone to, bureaucratic public meetings in which they break you up into groups? Yeah. Well, yeah. the other aspect of that is, is that most of those people in that room wouldn't be in the room unless they agreed to the predetermined outcome. So when they sit in the room and all of a sudden they realize, well, wait a minute, I see a little bit of a problem. Well, that's okay, because the facilitator has been trained to take these people away from that and just let, let's push them over here and we'll still get it approved because you're just one of the group that was here and even without you we can still do it with the rest of the group that's here that's agreeing to go along because they see it as nirvana they see the end result of the claim of dams being removed as such a wonderful thing when you look at the clean energy jobs bill okay the green jobs bill oh my gosh it's so wonderful but you read about the electric rates going up. Every They want to charge more for carbon. Well, they eliminated carbon by, well, the grid is full of carbon-based generation for what we do. But the natural gas people talk about the natural gas generation is clean, and the state wanted it to be clean. But now it's turned into punitive. So you go home and you turn on your light switch, understand they want to punish you for turning on the light switch. Now, to be fair, we must be clear about this. The natural gas uh, generation is granted a carve out for now. That's right. All right. This is how they're trying to get you off of any kind of uh, so called regular carbon fuels. They know that they have to have natural gas to be able to uh, crank up generators when the sun doesn't uh, shine and the wind's not blowing right. in order to fill the peaking mode. And especially since we've decided that we have to shut down the Boardman coal plant uh, up north, too. That's right. You know, that's also uh, part of it. It's also Kate Brown. And by the way, Kate Brown controls the uh, the green or the uh, smart meter agenda too. That's so right. just just remember that, okay? It's all connected. It is, including this uh, this bill 2020. But anyway, if you uh, if you email me, I'll send you an example of their uh, of Green's comment. And like I said, they're very nice people. They're just very wrong. You can take kind of the same verbiage and twist it around and put in your own thoughts about where we're going. It's a very polite. It's very succinct. And they're very good at it. That's right. And so, why am I trying to reinvent the? <laughs> you know, let's uh, let's take a page from their book. It's working. Well, what I sent I sent this to Bill earlier today, and as I look at this one, this is from the Oregon State Legislature, and it's literally how to testify to a committee. They actually have a website with how to testify to a committee. I also have it in that 15-page PDF. If you email it, I'll send it to you. And when you look at it and you understand that all of the people that want to bring this forward have already seen this document. And how many in here, by a show of hands right now, how many of you in here have seen the document? 
Okay. A handful so, out of a couple hundred people. <laughs> okay, right there. But before that point, if you look at it, and you're fighting an enemy that is prepared, that's the simplistic part of what you have to do. So we have to struggle to move ahead as fast as we can to understand some of the things. Thus, the nature of why we're having this meeting tonight. So, But if you break this down, if you have the ability to read what Bill has just mentioned, if not, you know, you, you get in here with what they do. Public testimony, public testimony before a committee may influence the committee's testimony and become a part of the public record. See, that's what we're after. We're after becoming a part of the public record. And the copy I have is kind of blanked out on one side, so I probably missed a couple of words. But I wanted to get to that public record type thing. They can't do this to us without falsifying the public record unless our silence is our consent. That's the simplistic thing of it. So the more and more people that we can get on board to do this, a few years back, as an example, we went uh, and we went very strongly against a package for a vehicle mile travel tax. Okay, that was basically shut down in that meeting, and they had a whole consensus process moving ahead with this whole thing. All of this was done in that way, having moved it ahead. It was almost there, and the legislature was looking to pass it. And off that one meeting here. It basically killed it because of what was said in public comment. Okay, in particular, there were some things that spelled out certain things. We could go into these. I'm not going to because for simplicity and time, for what we have, we have to go into a broad-based attack, and then we have to continue that attack. So what Bill and I'll do is on the show, we're going to be keep releasing things that we can continue to do this. And as you get it, you can always make more comment. You can keep making comment to it. And it's like, as long as we maintain our involvement and show that we are larger than them, okay, that we have valid uh, public input, all of these things, that's the history of it. So when we do it, we go ahead, I, I want to listen to exactly what they say and try to say, let's move ahead on their own theory and then go with the comments. So, be familiar with the committee process is one of their other headings. How many in here are, are familiar with the committee process? <laughs> okay, none of us. So we're what are we? We're going back to environmental justice. We're a disadvantaged community. <laughs> That's the reality. So I look at this and I say, one, know the location of the building and meeting room, and be um, and be on um, on time for the meeting time. Again, part of my thing is uh, rocked out here. The wonderful state the way it prints out. Agendas are posted outside the meeting room. Check the agenda and the bill you're interested in. It has not been removed. Blah, blah, blah. If possible, attend a committee meeting before you testify to the process so you can watch videos of past meetings. There it is. Watch videos of past meetings. We don't have time to do that. We only got another day and then we have to do this. So what we have to do is just go in and hope and pray and do everything right to his best of a move that we can. All right, so yeah, let's cut to the chase. What do you think are some of the weakest points of House Bill 2020 and the ripest avenues of attack Well, that we can use in comment? I'm going to look at it and say I'm going to bow to a lot of stuff within the punitive level, okay? Okay. Now, when we look at this, and I'm going to go back to another thing, the, the next one was Northwest Natural had one also. And it, it, as I read this, the allocation of customer allowances directly to natural gas customers, residential, small commercial, industrial sales is in a manner that treats all utility sectors emissions consistently. And that, that goes to a, for a cap and trade program to be equitable for the 65% of Oregonians who are natural gas utility customers seek the following. So when I, I look at that and I say, well, how do you comment to that? Basically, you comment to it as, I am growing older, I'm on a fixed income, I have to project out my expenses to the year 2030, whatever you want to say, whatever years that you want to look at and say, I will not be able to make my payments. 
I won't, you know, I won't have the income availability to make those payments. You can say things like that. And by the way, this paper that he's looking from, we have about 200 of them out front. Well, that's a different one. Oh, that's, that's a different one? one? Yeah, that's a slight Okay, well, there is, that's a, there's a lot of it there, though. Yeah. Same people. Same people. Same it's people. it's well, out the there. Same, just look, just look the for the nice blue natural people. gas one. Okay? That's just grab a copy one. of it, all right? Average person in this room, 50 bucks extra a month within the next few years. Right. For your natural gas bill. And it just ends up going to green, politically connected uh, industries. All right? That's, that's just the first year. That's just the first year. Right. First year. Yeah, it's the first the year. It's all it just keeps exponentially. Oh, well, you have the Avista. Come on up. No, 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 no I'm serious. Break it down. I, I can't, I mean, I'm not speaking here for this, but I'm kind of Hey, you're tearing up my front yard right now. The very least you can. <laughs> By the way, they're replacing the gas mains. It's for a good reason. Okay. You're doing fine. Okay. You're saying once it gets rolling, it's going to okay. ramp it up from there. That's Are there any other questions or comments? I think we can now start kind of loosening this up a little bit. We kind of hit the main yeah, take on it first. Uh, gentlemen, please. Uh, Ray Johnson. From uh, hi, Ray. Go ahead and speak up loud and proud, okay? I wonder about the basic, uh, the basic falseness of the whole proposition of global warming being caused by CO2. Now I agree with you. Here's the problem. I don't know if that's a convincing argument on a Saturday comment. Ed, you well, any thoughts on that? It could be part of your comment. Yeah. yeah. Right. It could be part of your comment. Yeah, I think it's key to. to I brought here as an example. This, this is a big shock. That's right. I, yeah, I agree, but it but also comes into my scientists can beat up your scientists and, no, and, and those no, sort of arguments we get into. That. You can see what's happening in this country today. <laughs> you can see the weather. You can see the predictions by scientists that it's key to solar cycles, right. and it's not to to CO two. Well, certainly put that in your climate then, in your in your comment then, please. Yeah. 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 I'm just like saying, I just don't know if it is the, it's something that gets them to vote no on 2020. That's my only question. Like, yeah, we, in the time frame that we have, again, that a, a well-structured comment like that with scientific background. Yes. I have one here um, that Eli had put together. And I mean, this is probably six pages he wrote as a comment. Six pages as a comment, okay? And it's, he goes into scientific evidence. He goes into all these different things. And he had the time to do it beforehand. Yeah. If you don't have the time to do it beforehand, we still have to show that we don't want it, okay? So as we do that, we can continue to make these comments. In fact, each and every person in the Oregon legislature that is capable of voting on this needs to get a letter with our dissatisfaction and a comment to the bill. Explaining to them what they do. There's little email listings. Now, you might say, well, they're not our representative. Doesn't matter. If they see that they start getting all of these things, it affects the historical record, and they can look bad, and thus they can actually be held accountable down the line. And you can also see how uh, ignoring the the official record later on could be used in a lawsuit. That's Lawsuits exactly in the future right. could be filed. One never knows. But the main idea is to be is to put it down in writing. We're not all going to get a chance to write. Now, I want to make sure you get Ann in here. Ann, go ahead. I had the pleasure of um, getting acquainted with Wayne Hage, who was with Sage Bush Rebellion a yes. long time ago. Um, there is a coordination that you can do, and I think it's a federal law. You can ask for coordination when you get some kind of a stupid-ass law, and you can, you can take it to the the people that are important, and you can say, we want coordination. I think the Pacific Pacific Legal Foundation will probably help you. But when you, the, they got the Texas, the Trans-Texas uh, Freeway stopped. Yeah. Because well, they were going to go right through the middle of Texas from Mexico, and they got it stopped. Right. And they did it with coordination. Well, the aspect of coordination is, you're exactly right, it is a legal binding situation. It is mandated in law. As I understand it, we need a, an organizational body to govern that coordination. I That's how we so. have to demand I it through I think if you, if you get a, 
that no. some, an attorney involved in? I think you got something like the Pacific Legal well, Foundation. I think they go after them. That, uh, that's a long-term thing, and we can't do that in the next day and a half. That's True. the only thing. That's all I'm... Yeah, we're, we're trying to keep it focused on what we can yeah. do Saturday. That's why we we're just but going there. It's, it's something right. to think about. I actually, I actually you know, learned quite a bit about the term you're using, coordination, yeah. and I it's don't want to go into a world into that right now because it deviates from the task at hand, but it's, it's a valid point, and you are absolutely correct. We only have a day, that's yeah, right. So what our thing is is to try to get ahead and do this in a way that makes sense. All right, gentlemen in the cell, go ahead, please. Uh, are, are these people fiduciaries? Are, are, do they act in a position that they have a fiduciary responsibility to do no harm to anybody else? So, as, as a matter of a comment, though, is this something that could be effective for a yeah, fiduciary? Are, are state legislators fiduciaries? Absolutely. Okay. And that's the key point. And I smiled when you said that because it's probably one of my favorite terms. Yeah. <laughs> and it, as I would term it, is they have a fiduciary duty and obligation to do no harm. Okay. And if they fail in that, 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 that is legal ramifications. That's exactly they right. Call before a council or somebody else with a citizenship and your failure of fiduciary responsibility. Now the problem we face, if you read the bill, the bill moves everything to an administrative rule situation. Okay? So it moves it out of the constitutional court. It moves court. it out of the statutory part of it with all of the enforcements and all of the things in it. And see, that's, that's the part of it that once it becomes a law, or a bill, you know, they adopt it, and then it's divided off, and then that's when it gets even harder yet. That's why we have to fight now. The idea is and to not have it pass. That's right. Know, really, that's it. Uh, Patrick, you were, I'm, just, I'm just kind of grabbing people that I saw raising their hand. No order here. Go ahead. One of the things that's kind of offensive here to me is uh, we're learning that this is intended and acknowledged to be punitive toward us. The root word is punishment. So you're saying, well, what am I being punished for? What it comes down to is you're punished for being here. That's right. You're punished for That's existing. Right. So that should help us understand what we're well, up against. You're punished for existing. Let's take what you just said and fully drink it in for a moment and then just go back to what you said a few moments ago about a fiduciary and then go to what I said, a fiduciary duty and obligation. Once they took that elected office, they had a fiduciary obligation and duty not to let us be harmed in a punitive manner. Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. Put it in your so comment. What I just gave you was a one sentence comment. If you don't have any time left between now and Saturday, if you took the time and wrote that sentence down and sent it in, <laughs> that's, that would work as a comment. And that's actually a legal enough situation on the comment that you might get it kicked out on your own. <laughs> okay. So all or, of these things. Or else, what's the consequence of them violating their fiduciary duty? Well, that's the scary part in order to break them. Okay? The scary part is what is the actuality? Well let me explain how I understand it with what I researched. ORS 164.075, felony theft by coercion or and, and I think the next one is felony theft by extortion and coercion. Okay? And then it's to find out that when an elected official uses his office to unjustly enrich someone and then penalize the other party to enrich that other person, it is a felony in the state of Oregon. Yeah. Now, is that, if, that, if that isn't a definition of House Bill 2020, I don't know what is. This, that's what I, but the thing is, is enforcement of that. It's how to get it enforced. Okay, hold on. Uh, ahead, Kevin, sorry. what was the question you asked so people back? That's why you got to say it loudly. 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 Bring it out loud. I'm okay, waiting. Here. I'm waiting. What's the consequence? Okay. Yell it. What's the consequence of not fulfilling fiduciary duty? What's the punishment for it? What's the punishment for not fulfilling a fiduciary duty? They're politicians. <laughs> well, now there we go into the room. Okay, what, what we just did is go into the realm of anger. We can't afford anger. 
All we can do is afford learning and understanding what we can do. But we can't let judges make law. Well, if we if we operate under the guise of the administrative state, we have to worry about an administrative decision. Okay? Now this is the part of it that the big difference is. This is where people lose where we don't understand that. So what we have to do is stay in the baseline of these things. But we can remind them of that term, of an obligation and duty. Okay? We, and how do we remind them of it? We have to use the term. It's been forgotten. Nobody uses that term anymore. That's a mantra. That should be a mantra. Fiduciary. That's, that that's is an excellent. It. Gentlemen in the back, I want to make sure you get questions and we continue to move along. Yeah, I have a, a great comment to make to the whole fiasco. Uh, a green economy? Why are they treating us like we're colorblind? We used to have a green economy, and now they're giving us a brown one. No color Wonderful. Now, but, but use that. Put that in your comment. Go ahead. There's nothing wrong with that. Francine, you wanted to say something. Exactly. And that's kind of the idea. But my understanding too is that we are going to try to find some people who can speak really eloquently eloquently and because we're going to be limited to the speakers. Right. And so I want to, you know, make everybody like if there's something that really moves you that you feel you can express well verbally at this meeting, to, to grab onto it and let us know now so we don't get people saying the same thing over and over again. I would love Mr. Fiduciary back there to make a verbal <laughs> comment on the <laughs> using that too. Right. I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm going to steal from the best. That's okay. You know? And going along with what Ray was speaking about a few minutes ago, you can choose to battle the scientific information. Right now, we don't have time, in my mind, for that. We have to come up with a comment that defeats the enemy before Saturday. You know, I look at it and I say, well, that takes research. You can, you can gather the research. You can do all of the things. But as you go ahead and you do it, you say, well, if that aspect of it, if I'm, uh, if I'm at a loss, they're going to resort to the consensus-based process scientists that are involved in this, like I talked about. All of these people have agreed the, the best available science, is a term I use all the time, that they've used to get us to this point. So when I look at that, I think, well, how do I defeat them? I'm going to defeat them different ways. That's all I'm, and if I'm going to write a longer term comment, I'm going to write it based on science, but I'm going to get much more involved, and it'll be six to eight pages, and I'll do that part of it, and that way it's submitted into the historic record, okay, and that's the key, and I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, can, can we ask some questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there will be, from what I've heard and what I see in their documentation, there may be a question period. Okay, but, well, my but, question is, the Northwest Pacific Power Planning Council has put out a 400-page document. In that document, it says that they, they agree that we will be short of power, electricity, during times of high heat and cold. Right. And so their only response to that is what they call demand response. And That's the smart meter. It's the smart meter. Yeah. So they're going to raise... They're going to raise the cost of electricity until we can't pay for power when it's too hot or too cold. So, can we ask them what their response is to that? Are you going to run poor people? I'm, what I'm going to do is address what you're saying very simply. Somewhere in this paper work that I have in front of me, I have a, uh, I printed off a copy of what they're actually here to discuss. Okay. And they're not here to discuss electricity. Okay. So while you're, that comment is a worthwhile and a necessary one to make, that's one of the ones that has to come later. Okay, that's the one. And that's what I said. This is not a one-night process. This is a, is a, a level of understanding that we have to continue with this, and we all we have to do is sit down and start writing the right words. If we start writing the right words, we can force them out of it there. And a, there's a guy back here who's had his hand up a long time, so. Go right ahead. I think uh, the best 
comments I can make have to do with uh, having been a climate believer. I was pretty zealous about the dangers of climate change. And I went to the FERC hearings and spoke against uh, the pipeline, and I stood in the rain and just so I could see uh, the governor and say, stand up for all again. And I wrote letters, and I had a radio show. I brought people on and talked about the wonders of the green economy and all the uh, wonderful jobs it's going to create and how it pays out all these evil carbon things. But I've been studying uh, the other side of it, and I, I don't know if I'll say uh, I don't believe carbon is a pollutant. I don't believe it's contributing to warming. The oceans aren't going to boil in 12 years, and there's not going to be a rain of fire from the sky. Um, but I think I want to say, I got the email from our family farm that worked with the GMO crop in. I still believe in that. Um, so I sent the director of that uh, organization, something a friend of mine, Great Ryan Sims, two emails in response. And one of them was, um, I think it might have been one of, one of your links that came to me also this week. We talked about how HD 2020 will hurt farmers. I didn't quite understand it, but it had something to do with vehicles that don't go on the roads. Is there a tax on fuels that farm equipment uses? Yes. It also talked about how farms need natural gas for heating and drying crops. Yeah, There's all sorts of reasons it's used. Uses, so this is going to hurt farmers. So I mean to counteract that statement, and everyone loves farmers. You can get the farmers and they help to buy something and it's hard to hard to be harsh on farmers. Can you explain the best way to say how it hurts farmers? Yeah, and for that, there's a, a copy of a handout that we have here, actually, and, a, and an explanation that when Bill was, uh, when he was reading the comment from the other side a little bit ago uh, about this, the uh, there was a point in there where they, they said they had, what, 200 uh, contacts? What's that? Yeah, 200 contacts. 200 yeah. contacts. But if you actually go to this, the other one, now, we... Yeah, this is a release I have. I'll give you a copy of it. Or you can also email me. I'm going to put it on the uh, radio station website tonight, too, when I get home. But House Bill 2020 does not work for Oregon agriculture. This is from a number of, uh, of ag groups. Oregon Blueberry, OFS, Columbia Gorge, Oregon Farm Bureau, Far West Agribusiness, Oregon Women for Ag, uh, Oregon Clover, uh, Oregon Seed Council. We're, we're talking like every, just about everyone of uh, who's who. HB 2020 will levy cost increase on America's farm and ranch families through the purchase of fuel and natural gas. As price takers, farmers have a limited ability to recoup the increased costs associated with production. Farmers operate on thin margins, and anyone who's a farmer, you know darn well that's true. All right? These additional costs put Oregon's agriculture sector at an economic disadvantage compared to farmers in other states and countries. House Bill 2020, in effect, turns Oregon into a somewhat of an economic island. Sure. Yeah, and, 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 and that's not good for our farmers. And let's see, and uh, oh, they say we are disappointed to see that House Bill 2020 includes agricultural fuels under the carbon cap. This will increase fuel costs for farm and ranch families by thousands of dollars each year beginning in the first year of the program. And there's a lot more to it than that. I'd be happy to give it to you. And if you like a copy of it. And it is just uh, just all over. But you see right now, there's also that scramble. Where everyone's looking for their special little deal. Screw that industry. Screw that farmer. Screw this and, and, and leave me alone. That's also a very corrupt part of the House Bill 2020 process. Hey, uh, yes. Yes, Carl. If I might, it notes here, and I'm kind of a numbers guy, as you know, that what we do in Oregon, if we do everything that we can to mitigate this carbon situation, we will influence the entire globe by 0.14%. And you're absolutely right. Now, I analogize that to providing all the comforts and benefits that this maneuver would provide to the citizens of John Day, Oregon. Everybody else gets screwed. 
Well, all right. Well, gonna, put, that, put that in your comment, please. I'm going to be an opportunist here for a moment, and I'm going to turn what he just said into a comment. Okay. Now you think about what he just said. You don't bring any scientific argument. You just make a statement. Okay. As a producer in Oregon, as a producer in Jackson County, Oregon, in Josephine County, but as a producer in Oregon, I see the effects of House Bill 2020 to be detrimental on every level, especially when considering the aspect that we will, it, none of the information available at hand from across a, a scientific board of consensus to all other scientific input that I can research shows no net benefit over the course of years projected to 2050. There is no benefit. That is, also, there, that is also another key phrase to use. When that's you right. Can. No there net benefit. is no benefit. Okay, so now that's what I want you to understand where I was going with that. You're showing that the action has no benefit. That's entered into the historical record. Okay, you've made that commitment to say it has no net benefit. Thus, why are you being punitive? Okay, and this is the thing. This is how we have to address these things. We okay. have to be thought out in that way. So, no net benefit, fiduciary. Uh, what are some other things? Punitive. Thank other, you for other? fulfilling your your judiciary obligations and coming to speak to us today. <laughs> well, I'm not a fiduciary, but we like to play one here in the crowd tonight. All right. Now, man, uh, before we do, I wanted to just mention something else here. Uh, there is a cheat sheet out front. I don't know if you have it. Uh, five reasons to oppose House Bill 2020. Number five is a very good one. If you uh, don't want to get into the my scientist could beat up your scientist routine, but this still is a nice little factoid. According to testimony from the director of Oregon State University's Climate Change Research Institute, so that's pretty valid. A cap-and-trade program in Oregon would do almost nothing to impact global climate change. We need to find a better solution that works for our families and environments. Uh, and also would penalize companies that make or grow things in Oregon. We've been talking about that already. Price of fuel increases immediately by at least 16 cents per gallon. Natural gas and utility prices, $1,500 per year per family. That is punitive, once again. I don't know how many of you can just all of a sudden write another check for 100 bucks a month so that uh, Elon Musk can perhaps sell some more, uh, I don't know, some of his big battery uh, situations here. And also we're a national leader already in renewable energy. All right, so there's some nice, uh, some nice uh, cheat sheets there. Larry, in the back, you were bugging me a while back. Go ahead. You know, I just wanted to make a statement. I keep coming back to the science, and I know that you can't talk about science from the green side, this is a matter of settled science. Settled science. The uh, uh, very, very definition of science is that it is never settled. Yeah. We're always looking for the truth. Okay? Settled science once had the earth flat, okay? Even though I know there are flat earthers that call me. <laughs> We are reading patients. Well, we went from 300 parts per billion to 400 parts per billion. That's per billion of carbon in the atmosphere. Ask any chemist. The effect is zero. We have had a crotch perpetrated against us ever since Al Gore's movie. Okay? And this, the whole premise of this bill is on quicksand. It's on shaky ground. It should not be regarded. That's, but the thing is, they're assuming that we're just going to stay home and watch sports this weekend. Don't let them do that. Don't let them have that. Oh, yes. The uh, Joint Committee uh, for uh, Carbon Reduction will be here. It's about uh, eight, nine people will be here. And there will be other ones also available. I'm sorry, we're going to try to get... Uh, hey, guys, what, well, I want to continue that thought for a second. And it, it leads to more comments. But this is going to involve Bill and Kevin, because I have to remember where it was. Um, there was a, on Bill's Facebook page, there was a video link to a a professor that was uh, basically addressing the crowd a little bit smaller than what we have here tonight, but it was a bunch of students on climate change. And I don't remember his name, but Jordan, Jordan it's on, I believe it's on Bill's Facebook page, isn't it? Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peters, okay. Oh yeah, Jordan Peters. Okay. So now, 
this video, if you haven't seen it, how many, is there, am I talking about something, everybody here has seen it? Okay, so this, the lady in the audience goes through this long, involved, feel-good question. I mean, she spends three minutes asking this question about, you know, what to do, and he just goes, do you, and I think the result of it was, she said, do you, do you think that we can get together and bring everyone together to face this danger and, and create a better world without this danger of climate change and carbon in our air? And she finishes this after three minutes of asking this, and she goes everywhere feel good that she can go, and he looks at her and he just says, no. <laughs> And Good. it was like she didn't know what to do. It was just an absolute. And going with what he just said, it is an absolute. I brought a copy today. And, you know, you go to Noah. It keeps track. This is where the buck stops of sea level trends. And you get all of these things combined. You can reinforce on a quick argument with someone or make a comment. But the stated things in there are backup for you to make the other comments for right now. The simple comment has to come by Friday or by Saturday. Okay? The complex comments have to start coming from there. And we're going to start trying to figure out how to do this more often. If we can do it where people will come and we can do this, we'll try to get comments where that be, can be fashioned and hand around. The hard part is you can't, I can't just write one up and put it on Bill's site and have everybody send the same thing, they view that as one comment. Okay, so That's why we're talking good. about particular phrases. You do things yourself. You put it in your own words. You give it the impact and the emotion and the passion and the passion that you have. I'm just going to go around and just I'll just start with you and then we'll just do it quickly here. I don't want to Bill, waste like too much time. I'd like to follow on your last comment and I'd like to follow on your first comments. Okay. These gentlemen are really pointing out something very, very important. Um, from my 30 years of public hearing on the, on the subject of energy, what you should do, my recommendation, is take words and make powerful word pictures. If he says economic island, everybody gets a picture. If I say economic holocaust, you have a different picture. That's right. So those we learned in the energy industry, you cannot fight emotion with fact. I heard that indirectly referenced tonight. I think it's a very excellent comment. Details to follow, but you have to belly up to their bar and address this with effective word pictures wrapped into your short comment so that it sticks in the mind of that legislator, sticks in the mind of the politician, that you are just emotionally invested on the other side of this issue as those other folks who've been preparing a lot longer than people in That's this right. room. That's exactly right. Okay, I'm just going to go from right to left here. Gentlemen, you've been there for a while. Also remind yourself what the consequences of this action because this is going to impact the economy and we want them to know that if they do that and then the businesses and people leave this state that they are responsible because as soon as they took over the Senate and House and they hurt the economy and they are responsible for it and the next time you're going to understand and the other states, it's good for, for this state to get hurt if this happens, the other states would not follow the lead and understand what's going on. All right, so thank you. Put it, that, that they're not going to get re-elected. Remind them. All right, uh, gentlemen, and now I'm going to go to, okay, you had your hand up there for a long time, then I'll get to the, go to the hat. <laughs> okay. Yes, go ahead. Well, um, I need to know more about how the money is going to be used when they do the line. <laughs> 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 good luck. Good, good luck. Uh, because, you know, uh, a fast factoid. Cap and trade law raises immediately $550 million in new revenue for the state government. No accountability on how lawmakers and government employees spend the money. It is about the money, though. Well, when you read the bill, I'm gonna, uh, now here's a comment. When I read the bill, there's page after page after page of how they're going to divide the money up. <laughs> okay, now think about that for a moment. The accountability is one thing, but when you look at the actual 
joyful, it, that's another example of an extorted, unjust enrichment. You can go to that level if you want to. What was that? Another lottery. Uh, <laughs> put it that way. Uh, Mr. Hat, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just calling you that because it's easy. Give me a simple answer for this. Okay. Is what they're doing illegal? Oh, it's legal. Is it lawful? That's a different story. Though. <laughs> okay, I'm going to answer you very directly. It is right now. Okay. I'm, I could tell you the whole story. I don't have time. But a few years ago, there was a, a mining district situation where, you know, they decided to challenge what they were doing. Okay. In, the, in reality, they lost their lawsuit suing them because they hadn't passed it yet. You can't do anything as long as it hasn't been passed. Why is it a law? Now, what, well, hang on. What, what, now, what they're doing, if they pass it, they have the emergency clause in it. The very, very last page. It's going to be brought in under the emergency clause. That, that prohibits us from moving quickly to try to move against it as, as the people of the state. It also so, backs back to the Supreme Court. That's right. They built that into this bill. That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. So it, it becomes, what you face in the judicial community, I, and I, I try to explain this to people uh, in the smart meter situation and a few areas there, that has to be the considered part of it. You can sue, but if you sue here, it's troublesome, very troublesome. And the reason that that is is because, we've talked about this on your show, the Bar Association supports sustainable development. Okay. Now, sustainable development is a defined term. It's not a concept. It's not something that somebody says, oh, I want to be sustainable. Sustainable development, as it's referred to in all of these documents, is literally in regards to the laws of the United Nations, the administrative rules of a governing body outside of our country, not the laws of the United States. Now, when you go to the proofs of that, it's all over. But we're under an administrative rule system that we have to do this correctly. Well, it has to be sued in a variety of ways, but the simplest way is to go outside of the state to the federal court system. And you have to get it to just about almost the Supreme Court. In Washington, D.C., there's a circuit basis court that you would present this to. But I can't go any deeper than that right now because the timing doesn't work for what we have to do for tomorrow. Yeah, you we just have to concentrate for Saturday. That's the hardest part. But Gentlemen anyway. in the back, now I'm going to go to you on the left there, so or my left. Yeah, I was just going to say that you know, this whole process is really nothing more by the legislature than an end around the fact that we voted down the sales tax multiple times. Yep. Eased the money, paid off the current debt, and then we're going to get into the next You know who's going to love that? Billionaire uh, Gan Greener, Tom Steyer from California. He's going to love it. And by the way, they will also uh, use the profits from the uh, carbon cap and trade to recycle into Oregon state legislative election processes. So you can imagine how, you know, they'll make sure that they, um, well, that you're, disin that you're disempowered some more at the electoral process there. Excuse me just a second, I'll get to, get to you. You've had your hand up, I think, for two hours now. Well, thanks, Bill, for getting us all together here. Um, what you've been talking about as far as the facilitator and the communitarianism, it's all Agenda 21. They're yeah. coming down, they've already got their predetermined outcome. It's a kind of a feel good for everybody. Um, so I'm not really articulate enough to get down into the grasses like that gentleman, he hit it right on the head right there. So my call is for numbers, that's why I called you to help launch the Yellow Vest mm -hmm. to get as many people out as we can to show them that they come down to our little town and they get a turnout that they're not prepared to see. It's gonna it's gonna stick in their minds when they go back. That's exactly right. And that's the whole idea. By the way, is everyone here planning on going to the Saturday hair hearing? Okay. Are you gonna get a, a vest if you don't have one? Okay, great. Because it is about showing. You have to remember the yellow vest. And a lot of people haven't talked about it. The yellow vest has not been reported very deeply in the United States. 
And I know that some people, you know, the problem is that anybody can put on a yellow vest and you can be an anti-Semite jerk or do something else. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't negate the fact that the first yellow vest protester was protesting the carbon tax on his diesel fuel that was just, uh, just reducing the ability for him to live and work. And that's where it started. Gen uh, lady, please. Okay, I was... Um, nice and loud. Okay, why don't you come up here? Come on up here. Yeah, I know you're a little, little soft here. I wish I had a longer cord there and just uh, hit it up that way. Go ahead. My testimony was going to be on how uh, carbon uh, CO2 could be changed into carbon credits and how Al Gore made his money and how rich he is yeah. and how the decision was made and, the, and then I've also included two maps, one Agenda 21 showing how when they get through depopulating the United States that uh, there's only going to be 10 megacities. And then I've got a 2030 map of the uh, megacities. Yeah. Is that okay? I, I don't know. There's nothing wrong with that per se. I, it just kind of muddies the deal. That's all, the only thing I get concerned about. In the time that we have before Saturday, I would say that I would move a different direction. Okay. In the longer term, this is information that has to be transferred in, in thus into them, you know, from this point on, that we don't accept it. Okay. What was the name of the um, company that uh, made all kinds of money in building solar panels? Solyndra. Solyndra. Yeah. How about that one? Oh, sure. Nothing wrong with that. We had the Betsy credits. We've had all sorts of, uh, now the, uh, the per We've had all sorts of that, but yeah, I would try, I would try to stay away from too much of the Agenda 21, even though it's absolutely true, it's valid. Uh, Vision 2030, Pathway to 2050, it's all part of the same scam. Let me explain it this way, as much as I know about it, and I could start right now and talk for about another four hours about it, okay? And at that point, you'd all probably want to drop dead anyway, so it's, it's like, but the reality to it is, that's what we're faced, but that's the big picture long term. That's what you have to worry about your children's future. Okay, that's reality. We can't worry about that by Saturday. What we have to do is make a comment to the actual harms, the actual intrusions. And that, that's another part of a comment. You call it an intrusion into my life as a producer. How many people, anybody in here work in the agricultural business? Okay, so what do you got? You know what you are? Officially, you're a producer. How many people work in manufacturing? You're a producer. You're a producer, okay? This is a war against producers. That's what it is. It's a war against producers. So when we look at that aspect, what type of comments do we take out of that? How many people here are retired? So now I look at that. Okay, now you're retired, which means that you have unlimited funds to be able to... <laughs> so what is the comment? What is the comment? The comment is, I am retired. This is a war against my ability to survive as a long-term resident, short-term resident of the state, however long you've been here, doesn't can, matter. Can but you it's be a, retired and still be a producer? Yes, yes. absolutely. <laughs> you can be. <laughs> absolutely. Hey, you, can, you can be both. But the idea is that you bring forth, you bring forward the harm that they want to visit upon you. I do it every day. <laughs> okay. As a producer, as somebody, you know, producing Santa Graham Lagrette, we use a ton of fuel. Sure you and, do. And the, the media lives of 40 employees that we have, 200 you know family members, mm -hmm. and then the effect goes on from there. But we're going through 10,000 gallons a month or more, and uh, you know I'm not one. Okay, up. okay. But I just what I here tonight is yeah. It's it's more important to show the effect on the ripple effect from your yes. computer yes. out. Yes. Show the effect. Absolutely. So okay. You said 10,000 gallons, right? You said you use about 10,000 gallons a month. 12, 15,000. Okay. Okay. 12, 15,000. We'll just take the basic uh, 16 cents a gallon. Uh, right now, there, your business Every instantly $1,600 a month or so, or month, if if not even more, that you are writing so that it can be redistributed People to another business that's more politically favored than yours. Changes 
we, we put a stock market and buy a fuel because I've got the ability to handle 70,000 gallons. Right. So when it goes down a dime, mm -hmm. it saves me $1,000 for every load of fuel I get. You know, so when it goes up 16 cents, that's $1,500. Yeah. How do you well, like this kind of a hedge coming from the, uh, the a reverse hedge, right? Yeah. A penalty. I mean, take it, take it in a simplistic form with what you just said. Let's say somebody has a farm around here and uh, the newest crop is what? Well, the marijuana industry, right? Or hemp. Or hemp. Yeah. So now the biggest, how to say, markets for the hemp industry, it, as what I've been hearing, is Florida. Okay. Other states. So now let me ask you a question. For the hemp producers, if you're out there, if you're not. But I just, this is theoretical in my mind. But a person that produces that crop, if he is literally on the books with any of it, which he has to be, now he has to pay more money up, right? Well, when they put the hemp farm together in Nevada, and they have to compete with those other people, whose hemp is going to get sold? That's right. And it's a simple thing. So it's a war against production. It is, it is a simplistic thing. If the young people that you know are looking forward to this as a future with the growing of hemp, you got to accept the fact that it's legal. I have to accept the fact that this is out there. But that's an example that takes you to a point of you, you know, you look at the actual war. If you're doing corn, if you're doing any type of agricultural crop, if you're selling over state lines at all, it has to be a competitive thing that you are going to lose on if you're, it's the same with the manufacturing thing. How about talks. forest fires? Who's yeah. paying for that increased fuel? I didn't, I didn't hear that. And for, on yeah. forest fires? So oh, God. Is, is that state? That's another hour or two, okay? Yeah. yeah. No, I'm yeah. just yeah. talking about the, the yeah. fuel. <clears throat> Oh, the fuel. Well, no. Well, government. I think government buys it on tax, don't they? Generally speaking. Now the contractors may not. Though. The contractors don't. I can't answer that completely. But, but yeah, you bring up a bring it up. Bring it up in your comment there. All right. But but once again, bring up the harm. Just to simplify something. Yes, Mr. McCoy. We read all these details. Yes. And go to your website. We should be able to pull out enough information that where we can identify punitive damages against us individually. That's right. Is that what's in here? Yep. Okay. So if you read this stuff, go to your website. We should be able to identify a nice short statement that makes sense. I will put it on my uh, show blog page when I get home. It'll take me a little bit of time to get home before I collapse into bed. All right. I want to get to the two women in the back. There's the woman there that I also want to get to. I'll get to everybody here real quick. Go ahead. Uh, lady in the far back, you've been like standing. Well, I'm sure we do, but and that's okay. I mean, hey, it, it's all fine. That's why I'll put it up on kmed.com on my show blog up at the very top where I have the info. You know, I'll put it right above the yellow vest. I have one of my yellow vests on the on it, and that way you can download the 15-page PDF, which is a lot of what, of what we've been talking about here tonight. You can then pull out not only how to comment, where to send a written comment to if you wish to, and send an email. You could also print it out and get little, uh, you know, just get little nuggets for your own comments so you can bring forth the harm that they want to visit upon you. Because that's it. You have to illustrate how they're, well, they're failing in their fiduciary duty to hold us harmless. So get right to you. Uh, lady in the back there, too. I um, want to know about so many, you know, uh, Southern Oregon Regional. Yeah. I have no idea, and uh, do you have an idea? I mean, generally speaking, it's wherever the grant stream funding uh, comes from is what they're usually in favor of. But again, you're in my realm of trying to figure out how all of this is perpetrated. But yes, so ready is a division of the consensus-based processes, Oregon Solutions, the Oregon Solutions Network, and these are what they do to establish a way to drain funds from the county 
they, they <coughs> seek donations, they accomplish very little on a, on a long-term basis, okay, that is tangible. And this is the hardest part, but they maintain a consensus-based influence. So you can go to So Ready and talk to them about, well, we're being impacted by this bill. We need you on our side. Well, So Ready is part of the consensus arm of the university system that Kate Brown controls. That whatever she wants, she can have happen through that process. So it's very difficult to go to what we should be able to go to is something like that and have an influence. The most that we can do is implore like our elected officials and we have to take every elected official that I you know that we deal with all over that we can do and, we and have to communicate our displeasure with them. and that's why it's important we're at that meeting and submitting the comments this is a political act that you're doing